I want to share a little bit about uh, Mother's Day. Um, probably I spend most time since my childhood with my mom last three, four months. It's because she's been ill and she's, she was in the hospital, in and out of hospital. Now she's in the nursing home. And uh, um, she's 87 years old. And uh, mom, who I know, growing up in suburban Chicago, so many times I get out of my room in the middle of the night to drink water or go to the bathroom, I see her praying. I, I, I clearly recall that. And she is one person that I could count on that she prayed for me. She really did pray for me all these years. And uh, I don't know whether you had a, a praying mother or not, but regardless, I was thinking this week uh, as I'm visiting her and seeing uh, grace of our mom. And I was thinking, wow, even a human mother devotes that kind of, that kind of life to me. And I was really reminded of the grace. And I know my mom prayed for me all these years, but I know Christ is praying for me right now. So I'm, I'm thinking about my, my mom in light of God's grace in Christ. So I'm just kind of sharing with you because uh, today's Mother's Day, we celebrate Mother's Day, and uh, I think it is good to appreciate and honor them, but let's put this, things into perspective. Grace of God, grace of God, okay? That is why I'm standing here. That is why I get to share the gospel, because she told me to go to church when I was young. She led me to church. Okay, I don't think I could say she led me to Christ, but she led me to church so I could hear the word of God. So with that as an introduction, uh, I want to spend next four weeks uh, from Gospel of John, which is the series that I'm doing, we're doing uh, at Stony Brook. And uh, yeah, until uh, the Matthew series begins on Father's Day. Okay, So about four weeks later, five weeks later, we're starting a, a new series on Matthew. And I ask you to prepare your life because we're going to be spending at least two years, I think, two years. And I hope you're still here after we're done with Matthew. And you may be thinking, what do you mean? So many people change churches and leave and just in and out. But I pray that you will learn the gospel from beginning to the end. See what Christianity is. Do you know what Christianity is? And I pray that you would have that kind of zeal because uh, at this stage of my life, I want to pour my life onto this into the book. And that is why I'm starting a new Matthew uh, in-depth study Bible, uh, a Bible study group. And if you want to learn, you could sign up. Okay? So uh, today, uh, the title of the message is very uh, something I really, really treasure. And this is the message that I'm going to preach in, in, in Africa. Next week, after next Sunday, we, uh, we get on a plane on Monday, and we'll be heading toward uh, Uganda, okay? And this is the message, message of resurrection, message of returning of Christ, message of real Christianity, okay? That's what I'm hoping to share in Africa. And for today, the title of the message is Destroy This Temple, Pause for a second. Can you imagine someone walks in here, destroy this beautiful sanctuary temple? Can you imagine how provocative that is, how offensive that is? And in three days, I'll raise it up. Let's think about what temple is. What's temple? Especially in Jesus' time, Jerusalem temple. Temple is where you go to meet God. You need to go to the temple where God dwells and present. God is present and you meet God. Temple is the place where God dwells. Okay? God dwells. And that's what the temple is. That's where you go to meet God. And that's where you 
what, what, where God dwells. And Jesus said, destroy this temple. Destroy this temple. Provocative. Who could say something like that? Destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. I will raise it three days. Uh, John chapter 2 carries the first miraculous sign. That's the key word in John's gospel. If you want to understand John's gospel, which is the last gospel to be written. John lived much longer than other, other apostles. Through miraculous uh, saving grace, he survived a boiling oil and lived up to possibly 100 years old, close to the second century. Most uh, of the apostles were dead uh, way before that. So John uh, wrote in his later years, John's Gospel, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Book of Revelation. Why is this sig information significant? Because this is the written as the last letters or the books to close the canon of the Bible. That's significant, isn't it? 66 books, but John wrote five of them as the last book, as the closure of the canon of the Bible where God reveals himself and God speaks what is to come. So it's very significant, okay? How you want to close the book. And this is the way God wanted to close the book. So John's gospel is written much later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, possibly 20, 20 years later. 20 years later. That's not a small amount of years. 20 years of Christianity expanding from Palestine all throughout Roman Empire. And he saw all, uh, all that is happening through Christianity exploding under the persecution in Roman Empire. And he writes uh, John's Gospel and includes seven miraculous signs as, as opposed to 60 of them in Matthew and Mark and Luke Gospel. Okay, that's one out of ten. But many of them, not many of them, few of them are not written in any of the other synoptic gospels. So what that means is, is this. John, to close the canon of the Bible, carefully selected miracles, and he called that signs. What is a sign? Okay. When you walk in here, you saw the sign that says, New Heart Mission Church. Okay. Let me illustrate that. When you try to drive uh, an LIE toward uh, west, toward New York City, you see a sign that says, New York City, 20 miles. Okay? Hmm. That's a sign. And sign is significant. But the sign is not New York City. Sign points to that great reality and the glory of New York City. Can you picture New York City? I don't know whether you like New York City. I love li living in New York. How many of you like living in New York? Would you say amen? <laughs> I love living in New York. I do, actually. When I go to Africa and when I go to Philippines, I always tell them I live in New York. Yeah. I live all my life in New York. When I get off at JFK, I smell whatever, and I smell like I'm home. I smell like I'm home, you know? and glory of New York City. But sign is pointing toward that glory. Here in John's Gospel, miracles are signs. Do you catch it? Seven miracles. Jesus turning water into uh, wine in a wedding, wedding party. What was that about? We're not going to talk about it much, but the water that was used for ceremonial cleansing of Judaism, which cannot cleanse anything, turning into wine. Okay, the second miracle, uh, the son of the nobleman in chapter four, right? And third miracle, someone who's been invalid for 38 years in the, in the pool of Bethesda, and he just, Jesus raised him up. And fourth, uh, fourth miracle, miraculous sign, feeding of 5,000 men with one lunch bag, five loaves of bread and two fish. And the fifth miracle is Jesus walking on raging water. And I like that one because I love sea. I don't like raging sea, but he walks on water. That's a sign. That's an insignificant miracle, but that's just a sign. New York City, 20 miles. OK? 
Can you imagine the reality of who he is? Can you imagine the reality of the kingdom of God? And the sixth mir miracle is someone who's been born blind, and Jesus heals in John chapter 9. What's the last miracle, miraculous sign? Raising Lazarus, who's been dead for four days. Resurrection is the last sign. Only seven miracles. Okay, only seven miracles. But sign is something that points to the great reality of New York City. If Jesus walks on water is amazing, can you imagine, can you imagine how amazing Jesus is? How great Jesus is. How great the kingdom of God is. Okay? So what is the sign about? And that's what today's uh, text is, is saying. I intentionally started from verse 11, which does not have to do with cleansing of the temple account that we are looking at. But it says the first of his signs, referring to uh, turning water into wine at a wedding party, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. That's an amazing, amazing statement. Sign, miracle, reveals something big. And something big is revealed so that you may believe. That's the purpose of signs. Do you catch it? You have to see it. You have to see who Jesus is in your soul to follow him. I personally believe, I share this in Korean service too, I share this in Stony Brook, I share this in Africa. If you meet Jesus, your life will change. If you meet Jesus, your life will change. I believe in that kind of Christianity. I'm convinced with that kind of Christianity. Okay? So the first of the sign Jesus did at Cana, turning water into wine at a wedding party in Galilee, did manifested his glory. Can you imagine Mr. Biden walks in here? And some of you are kind of like, you know, you, you will wake up when Mr. Biden walks in, walks in here. And you're going to feel his presence. Don't you think? With his sunglasses. You're going to feel his presence of the pres president of the United States of America. Can you imagine God walks in here? You're going to feel the presence. You're going to feel his aura. That's glory. Glory. Okay? Do you understand that? So that's what the verse 11 says. He did the first sign, manifested his glory, so that you may believe. Do you believe? If you believe, your life will change. Absolutely. Okay? After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stay there for a few days. And then the new account, okay? The Jesus cleansing of the temple, which is a... I love this story. How many of you uh, enjoy this story? Could you say amen? amen? I really do love this story. God, Jesus cleanses the church. That's what we pray all the time in our prayer meetings. Those of you who never been to our prayer meeting, you need to try our prayer meeting. We pray that God, would you cleanse, purify this church? Okay? That's what Jesus does. The Passover of the Jews, okay, that's very significant information because Passover is a significant event in the entire Bible. Passover is the Old Testament salvation story where God sent Moses and saved and delivered uh, two million Israelites from the Egyptian slavery through miraculous signs. Ten of them. Do you remember that? So it's the Old, Te Old Testament salvation story. And that's the biggest, if, the biggest holiday for Jews and the Judaism. It's like 4th of July, but not quite. This is like the biggest, biggest like, uh, holiday or religious day for people of Judaism at the time. So it was a Passover, and Passover happens to be very important information because in John's Gospel, you see three Passover, one, two, three, once a year. Jesus did three years of uh, public ministry. Passover, Passover, Passover. Why is it so significant? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain, came into Jerusalem to be crucified. That is why it's significant. 
right? Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, you got to picture a Jerusalem temple, which is destroyed in, uh, about 30 years later by Roman Empire, Roman soldiers. Okay? When you go to Jerusalem right now, you do not see this temple because it is destroyed. You only see the wall. Besides, the whole temple is not Jewish. It's Islam. Okay, you only see the wall, the wailing wall of Jerusalem. Kind of interesting. God destroyed the temple twice. By Babylonian Empire and then by the Roman Empire. I think that's what God wants because otherwise you will worship the temple. Thinking like Mecca, we got to go there to meet God. Right? But God destroyed them. But at the time, in Jesus' time, the temple was still there. And it's, it's, it's the Mecca. Right, let me use that expression. It was the Mecca of Judaism. Okay? This is where you go. This is where you come in Passover from all over the world to sacrifice, to make it right with God, pay my temple tax. So I am a Jew. I am a you know, member of a Jewish religion. And I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm good with God kind of thing. So gee, uh, Passover of the Jews were, were, was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, this is a huge temple, a okay, huge temple. Where the presence of God wa uh, was, they thought, they thought, right? In the temple, he found those who are, Jesus found those who are selling oxen. Imagine this, okay? Imagine in, in sanctuary right here, we have oxen, sheep, pigeons, and the money changers. Can you imagine that? It's like a bazaar. It's like a, what, what is that thing? you call that flea, flea market yes thank you my son better do yeah. <laughs> flea market it's like a flea market you come to church and you see oxen here pigeon here money change there what is this so it was a circus it was a mess can you imagine that and this is what jesus jesus saw and jesus did something very very unthinkable he showed his rage. Rage. I said rage. Okay? His wrath, his anger. You know, how bad was it? Look at this. Passover the Jews, uh, Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple. He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there and making a whip of cord. Jesus made a whip of cord with a cord, uh, a cord that was tying the animals. And he made a cord, and he drove them out, all of them out of the temple. He clears the temple. He probably runs like a madman. Ah! ah! <laughs> Can you imagine? There were hundreds, hundreds of men. And he drives down every, everyone. Unthinkable. Jesus showing his rage. With the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of money changers and overturned the tables. Don't, don't stop me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine me doing that? Overturning it. That's what Jesus did in the temple. He's showing his rage, showing his anger. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. And do not make my father's house a house of trade. Don't make this church a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house was consumed me. Could you just picture with me? Can you imagine what just happened? Can you just imagine Jesus starting out his public ministry, probably known, probably known by like different people from Galilee, through miracles and teachings and things like that. But when he finally came to Jerusalem and Jerusalem temple, he made a scene. Unthinkable. At the time, Jewish temple or temple of yeah, Jerusalem is like Vatican. Can you imagine I go to Vatican and do this? I'll be on 5 o'clock news 
okay, arrested or beat up by Catholics or something, you know? Can you imagine I go to Vatican and do this? Turning things upside down and driving everybody crazy, driving out of the temple, the Paul's temple, Paul's sanctuary, it just going crazy. But you know what? Nobody was able to stop Jesus. Nobody was able to stop Jesus. Nobody. Can I just ask you, why was Jesus so angry? You know, I was really meditating about this question. Why was Jesus so angry like this? Do you think about things like that? Where do you see Jesus being angry like this in the Gospels? Nowhere. He gets upset with Pharisees, hypocrites, false, you know, people who just talks. He gets upset hip with hypocrites, with Pharisees. But nothing like this. Nothing like this. Turning the tables upside down. The money was just, the coins were running all over the place. People were frantically looking for their coins to try to re, re, repossess them. And driving out animals. Like, where do you see like that? Why is Jesus upset like this? Can I just tell you why? Because he loves God is Father. Because He loves God is Father. Do you love God, your Father? And you should get upset too when you see people exchanging money, doing trade in the church. You should get upset. Do you get upset? I get upset. When I see hypocrites, I get upset. People who just talk. People who talk before they're themselves. I don't like that. Jesus was upset because he loved the world. Can I illustrate this? Anger is an essential character or attribute of God. Okay? Certainly, Jesus is this not sinful anger. Anger is not sin. It's the essential attribute of God. Let me illustrate that. I thought about this illustration. Not quite what this is, but you, you'll get the point. Let's say on this Mother's Day, today's Mother's Day, okay? And there is a lady who is about 95 years old, barely walking, okay? And it's a Korean yeah, 95-year-old mother. And then there are a bunch of other people, big, bulky, like looked so like violent, and they were like making fun of her. <laughs> Look at this. Women, Asian women, and pick up food and throw it at her. So this 95-year-old old lady gets food and again despised and made fun of, and then once in a while they punch her. Would you upset? Would you, Would that upset you? Would that upset you? You don't look upset at all. Would you get upset? Yeah. You got smiling. Would you, Would you get upset? Would you get upset enough to fight with these four big guys? I, I don't think so. <laughs> You're just, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. Would you risk your life and do it? I don't think so. I don't think you'll do it. But let's just say that the 95-year-old lady is your mother on Mother's Day. Would you fight him? Of course you will. You may get killed, destroyed, but you will fight. Why? Because you love your mother. Do you understand that? I don't think you will fight for them. Do you get upset about Jews and Hamas situation? Do you get upset about Ukraine? Do you even think about Ukraine, Russia situation anymore? Okay, just keep it to yourself. Yeah, please. Do you even think about it? Most people don't even want to look at it, right? Why? Because you don't care. It has nothing to do with you. But Jesus was upset because he was so offended because he loves the Father. Making a trade inside the church is more unthinkable thing than beating up 95-year-old lady. 
throwing food at her because God is holy. Do you understand that? Jesus was upset. What does that holiness mean? Holiness means, he's, how, how holy is he? He's perfectly holy. He's infinitely holy. You need to think about God so that you'll be drawn to God. Do you think about God? Most people in this day and age don't even think. They love to just check out YouTube shorts. YouTube don't work anymore because it's too long. So we got to look at shorts. That's human beings. You just don't have the patience. You just don't have the interest of knowing and thinking. That's most of the people. Do you think about God? God is holy, which means he cannot tolerate any sin and evil. His character and his attribute is he must attack, he must destroy, he must punish sin and, and get rid of it. Otherwise, he's not holy. Does that make sense? That's what the judgment of God is. Therefore, judgment of God is out of his attribute of holiness and justice. It'll be the judgment of justice. Absolutely just. You do not have to worry about it. You do not have to get involved about it because he will judge justly because he is perfectly holy and just. Do you understand? That's why Jesus was upset. Do you get upset when people don't act reverently inside the church? I hope you do. Okay? So that's why he was doing this. The zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews were probably like dumbfound. Can you imagine? All the uh, merchants at the time, because uh, it was kind of time it was, they had weapons to protect themselves. If someone to rob you, you you'll find. So all these people. And then there was a temple police. And then there is a, a, a priest of these this big religious establishment of Judaism. And yet, Jesus was driving all of them out with a whip, all by himself. What is that? I don't know whether that intrigues you, but what is that? That's the authority. That is the authority. That's authority. And the Jews responded probably like, what? In the world is this this man. He probably they probably heard of him from Galilee teaching this. Maybe he's a prophet. Maybe he doing these miracles. So okay, let, let's just figure out what's going on. So the Jews asked Jesus, What sign? Here's the word, the sign. What sign do you show us for doing this crazy thing? What, what are they asking? They're asking basically, you did this unthinkable thing. Now prove to us that you are something. Prove to us. You need to prove that you could do this. To our central establishment of the Judaism. Destroy. Like, you know, you're, you're just making a whole lot of mess. So what sign do you show us for doing this? So they were challenging Jesus' authority. Who do you think you are? And then Jesus says something even more provocative, unthinkable than what he has just done. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. Destroy this temple, Jerusalem temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Could you just think about that? If you ask, destroy New Har Mission Church building, I'll tell you, get lost. You know, what it, you, know, you know what it took to have this building? You know how much sweat and tears and... I, I would say, get lost. But for them, it was the Mecca of the Judaism. I want to talk about Judaism. What is Judaism in first century in Jesus' time? It's basically offshoot of the Old Testament. They believed in Old Testament. They believed in Jehovah. They believed in, in God Almighty. 
offshoot of Old Testament, but became cultic. That's what it, that's what it was. Became cultic. Why do you say that? How could you possibly say that? Because in the Old Testament, the Bible clearly says salvation is by faith alone. Through the promise, 400 years before the law was given, Moses came. Abraham was called righteous, justified because of his faith. In other words, from Abraham to Moses to Jesus to Martin Luther to you, God's plan was always saving his people through faith, through promise, and through in, in, in Jesus Christ. And yet, somehow, these Judaism, Ju Ju Jewish religion, basically took the law and they say, no, you could obey the law perfectly, like Abraham, and you could be justified, and you could be saved. That's what they taught. They believed Abraham uh, obeyed the law perfectly. What a lie that is, right? Do you remember the story of Abraham? He was just such a coward before Pharaoh. Twice he lied. Oh, this is my sister. Okay, just to save his life. Remember that? So Judaism is a cultic religion, basically saying that we could obey the law perfectly, Ten Commandments perfectly. So they cannot keep ten of them perfectly. In fact, they could not keep any of them perfectly. So what did they do? They made sub-laws, 600 of them. On Sabbath, they made 20, 23 sub-laws. And if you follow them, you are keeping the Sabbath holy. They could not keep the Sabbath holy. They cannot keep their heart set on God. They cannot commune with God and love God, restore God and rest. So made all kinds of rules. What kind of rules? If you see in John chapter 6, you cannot pick up the mat and carry it on your shoulder on Sabbath. How ridiculous is that? Remember that? The story of someone who's been invalid for 38 years. And Jesus healed him on Sabbath. And, 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 and the story says he carried the mat. And they were like so upset because like someone who's been he, uh, invalid for 38 years healed, which is amazing. They don't even look at that, but you carry the mat on your shoulder. That's how human beings are. That's how religion is. You know, in the Jewish religion, you cannot press the elevator button. So what do they do? They wait. John walks in. John, would you press the second floor? I, I didn't do any work. So it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But here's what it is. By making the law that they think they could manage, they say that's man-made law. They, they, feel, uh, they, they say to themselves, now we are obeying the law of God, which they can't. That's how ridiculous it is. So what's the difference? All the Jewish religion, and you are doing, you are doing the right things to save yourself. But Christianity says, you cannot do any of, the th any, of, any, of, any of it right before the Lord. In fact, you don't even have a desire to right, do the right thing before the Lord. You don't want God. Do you see the difference? That's why when Jesus walked into the sanctuary, people trading, and he was raging and furious. Are you trying to do business with the Lord? So many people... Don't get upset. I've been doing ministry for some years. Until they get into their professional schools, they come to prayer meetings. They seek the Lord. Pastor, pray for me so I can live for the Lord. As soon as they get into the professional school, they get the right to not to come to church and live for themselves. And I've never seen, so many people I've never seen. I think that's business, trade. What's business? I give something, and therefore I have right to earn something. That's business. How many of you do business to profit other people? You don't do business to profit other people. You do business with God so that you will profit yourself. You try to do business with God to profit yourself. Do you see how ridiculous that is? And God is so upset. You know why he's so upset? Because he's making, they're making the father's house 
into a house of den, uh, den, den of robbers. Betrayed. Don't do that. Jesus said later on, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't do business with God. You come to him as a beggar. You come to him as a beggar. Okay, let me continue. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. What is he talking about? You get a sense, right? In three days, I'll raise it up. You get the sense. And then the next verse kind of next verses explains it. Then Jews said, What? It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Don't be ridiculous. What sign are you gonna show? How are you gonna prove that you what you have done is you know you you deserve to do something like this? So they were just kind of challenging him and Jesus and John's commentary says, but Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body that's the gospel jesus had a body okay jesus is god but he had a body he came to earth with a body why because without the body he cannot die for you right so he came with the body he was speaking about the temple of his body, and that is the gospel. Okay, let me just share this with you. <clears throat> you know, if you remember last week from Second uh, First Peter, chapter two, verse twenty-four, it says, uh, "Where is that?" Hmm. Jesus bore our sin. And hung on a tree. And in his body. And he. And he died for us. He bore our sin on his body. In other words. Your sin. Is transferred to his body. Why? Because on the tree. With his body. He needs to have a body to hang on a tree. On the tree, with his body, he need to be punished. Because God is holy and he must punish and attack and destroy all sin. The penalty of sin is death. And all of you, all of you, and myself included, need to die. Whether you are uh, successful, whether you are educated, whether you went to church or not, you're going to have to die for your sin. Look at me, people. You're going to have to die for your sin. The penalty of sin is death. And God is holy. He must attack. He must destroy. He must punish your sin. But if you do, you will be destroyed forever. So God made a way. How did he do that? He came with a body. So mar so that he could hung on a tree and take the punishment and take, take the judgment upon himself, the penalty of sin, sin upon, self, upon himself on your behalf. That's what the gospel is. Destroy this temple. And Jesus' body is the temple. Jesus' body is where your sins are forgiven. Through the Jesus' body, you commune with God. Through Jesus' body, God dwells with you. That's what the scripture is teaching. Okay. And then he said, in three days, I'll raise it up. What is he saying? We see right here, he was speaking about the temple of his body. And when therefore he was raised, resurrected from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. What is he talking about? He's talking about, forget about this temple, my body. It's the temple. It needs to be destroyed and it needs to be resurrected. Okay? That's the body. That's the temple. How many of you uh, have Jesus in your life? Could you say amen? amen? We sang today. Unbelievably, Bible says your body is the temple of God. 
Soma. Soma. This is the temple of God. This is the real temple of God, not Jerusalem temple. This is the body, body, temple of God. Isn't that amazing? Because Jesus dwells in us. That's the kind of Christianity Bible teaches. And if you meet Jesus like that, your life will change. Your life don't change because you don't have Jesus. I share this in Stony Brook. I share this here. I, I'm going to be sharing this in Africa. I'm going to say this again. How many of you say, say to yourself, okay, see your life is changing? Do you see your life changing? I kind of observe for the last 15 years, because that's my role as a shepherd, I observe you, whether you are changing or not. And the truth is, all of you are changing. Some of you are changing, become more like Christ. Some of you are changing, become more like the world. That's just my honest observation. No human heart stays the same. Even your attitude towards your mother changes. I can sincerely say my attitude toward my mother changed. My, my attitude I'm talking about. Even your attitude toward your spouse change. Do you agree? Your attitude toward church change. Your attitude toward, certainly toward Christ change. All of your heart is changing. What's the difference then? What is causing agent of your change? Is it the Holy Spirit? Or it is the Spirit that is not of the Holy Spirit? That's what it is. Okay? So here it says, he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he has said this. You know what? You're going to have to destroy that temple. You're going to have to destroy Jesus' body. I know, that's a provocative statement. Listen to me, people. You're going to have to destroy Jesus' body. How can you possibly? You're going to have to cause it. You come to him with your sin and just place upon him. You're going to have to do that by faith. That's why Jesus' body was destroyed. Without that... There is no resurrection. You're going to have to destroy his body. Your sin needs to be given unto Christ. Not your righteousness, because you don't have any. Not your offerings, because it doesn't count that much. In, in greatness of God, what we give is not that significant. But your sin needs to be given to him. Not, I do this and I get that kind of business with, with God. But you come to him like a beggar. There's nothing I can do, Lord, and I want to surrender my life unto you. And all I have is my sin, and I give it to you. You're going to have to destroy his body on the cross. And Jesus said, and then I'll raise it up in three days. Then you will have real life. Have you done that? I'm just asking you. I'm not asking whether you're a deacon. I'm not asking your father is an elder. I'm not asking whether your father is a pastor or missionary, whatever. But have you done that? If not, you probably see your life changing this direction. You probably see it. As a shepherd, I see all lives are changing. I don't think anybody is like, always, always at the same place. Heart is changing. Are you being submissive? Or more and more, you just don't want to listen to anybody? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm married. I have two kids. What do you mean? I've been, I'm, I'm a deacon. Your heart is changing, people. You know, it says they believed after the resurrection. Disciples believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. Scripture speaks about resurrection. In the Psalms, 
And even Isaiah 53 speaks about the resurrection. In the Old Testament, it speaks about salvation by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted, credit to him, as righteousness. He was justified, saved by faith. From the beginning, that was way before the law was given. And yet, how do you come up with the idea that through the law you are saved? What kind of ridiculous statement is that? And that's the whole premise of, of Galatians' gospel. It just comes out of your wickedness and your ignorance, basically. From the beginning, from the beginning, and these, this Jewish cultic religion basically saying you could be saved by obeying the law. 600 of them perfectly when the word of God says you cannot keep any of them perfectly. You're saying, I am good, righteous. So I do this and you give to me, God. That's business with God. Don't do that. Your, your God is very, very upset about that. Come to him with brokenness. Would you do that? Would you come to Christ with brokenness? Over the years, I've seen some lives becoming that in this church. I don't think I could say that that's all of you. Listen to me. Over the years, I've seen through New Heart Mission Church, people really repented and come to Christ to the cross giving all his sin to him and their lives being changed. I have seen that. I do. How many of you have seen that kind of changed lives here at New, New Heart Mission say? Would you say amen? amen? I definitely have seen it. But I don't think it's all of you. I pray that your life will change. I do. I'm going to say it again just to rub you in a wrong way one more time. I've seen over the years at New Art Mission Church, lives being really changed in this church. But I don't think I could say that is true for all of you. My prayer is your heart and your life will come to him and live and live. Okay, that's what my prayer is. They ask for a sign. Remember, let's go back to the sign. New York City, 20 miles. And it points to that the glory of New York City. And Jesus said, this is the sign, the greatest sign. The sign that I'm going to show you is the resurrection. That's Christianity. Imagine the event of resurrection is amazing, but it's only a sign. Can you imagine what the reality of who Jesus is? Can you imagine what the reality of the kingdom of God is? If the resurrection is just a sign, can you imagine how great is the reality of Christianity is? What does resurrection point toward to? I'm going to say two things and and I'm done. Number one, because he was resurrected with a kind of life uh, that knows no more death, which means he's alive and he's eternal. He's eternal. And he conquered the last enemy, the greatest enemy, sin and death. Abolished, conquer, destroy the devil. Therefore, he's the Almighty, which proves that he is God. Which proves that Jesus is God and no one else, no other religion could claim this. Historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you think, I don't believe, I don't believe that, Pastor. I think that's just a myth. And you need to just do some study. Just Google some. I'm going to send you some articles. Read the Bible. Read the amazing connectedness of the entire Bible, which was written over 1,500 years by 40-plus authors. And then it speaks and points toward one, one, one thing, that resurrection, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through which God saves his people. Second thing, In Acts chapter 17, that resurrected Jesus Christ will judge all the living and the dead. He's going to judge you. Look at me. Don't fall asleep. He's going to judge you. You're going to stand before the judgment of God because he's holy. He must attack and destroy and and he have to 
punish all sin and evil. And that's what the gospel is. Because of his character of holiness and justice and wrath, there is the cross. All of his wrath has been poured upon his son that you deserve. All of it. That's the gospel. So you have a two option of where your judgment could take place. One is the cross. The other one is the white throne judgment. You, you have an option. You do have an option right now. When you pass, you don't have an option. Right now you have an option. You could just blow me off, as many of you have been doing for so many years. You could just blow me off. And just keep going and take a chance and see the reality of what, what the Scripture teaches. Jesus taught, my body is the temple. Jesus is where you come and meet God. Jesus is through which you have pardoning of your sin. Only through Jesus. Jesus is where the Spirit of God dwells within. And he lives in me. That's the gospel. In closing, in John chapter uh, 20, by believing, you may have life in his name. Do you have life in you? Some do. Some I don't, I'm not sure. Some do. Some I'm not sure. Do you have life in you? By believing. I really do believe if you meet Jesus like this, your life will change. I do. This direction I'm talking about. Not this direction. As you get married and get a job and making money, more and more people go toward direction. Most people go toward this direction. Pastor, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Has your life been changing? By believing you will have life. And the greatest sign of Christianity is the resurrection. The greatest sign of, of, uh, of Christianity is resurrection. Jesus was raised in three days. And it points to the glorious reality of his kingdom. Do you know who Jesus is? I pray that your life will be changing toward this direction following Christ. Because many are changing toward this direction following the world. And that's just the way life is. And I'm speaking to all of you. Okay? Destroy this temple. You're going to have to destroy Jesus' Jesus body on the cross. And I'll raise it up in three days. Let's pray.